Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for that amazing introduction, as always. Please check him out on the Internet. He's a native storyteller, and his story in and of itself is amazing. His work is phenomenal, and it's a kind of history we all want to be aware of. I have one of my favorite authors with me today, and I've read at least two of his books and have a few more that are on the back burner. And he has constantly challenged my my mind and sent me in directions of, of research myself. But on top of that he has he has the ability to to weave a story around historical events that brings you right into the time frame and makes you more greatly aware of the culture and the history and what was going on during that time that the book is all about. Tobias Curitan is internationally recognized for his insightful books on esoteric spiritual history, art, and philosophy. Accessible and scholarly, his works address believers and doubters alike, and remarkably, have stimulated spiritual experiences in some of his readers. I would be surprised if anybody who read this book was not awakened on some level within themselves. He has successfully widened the appeal of so-called esoteric spirituality with his warm style and depth of knowledge. He has entertained many thousands of readers in the process. He's also a filmmaker, lecturer, poet, and musician, and has recently recorded his orchestrated score for his prospective dramatic project, William Blank, Love is on Fire. And while his, mu- and while his musical about Nancy Kennard and Henry Crowder, You, Me, and Yesterday, was, which was co-written with artist and songwriter John Myatt, was performed to a great acclaim at the Litchfield Garrick Theater in 2011. He's composed and recorded six albums of original music. He has written dozens of books, and and I took most of this bio off of his website, which I bet has not been updated for quite a while, so that you can increase the number in everything. But it is truly my honor to have him on the show today. Tobias, welcome to the show. Lovely to be here, Barbara. Absolutely uh, great to speak to you again. And what a nice introduction. (laughs) <laughs> well, your bio says you've written 23 books. Is it more than that now? Yeah, I've just finished my 24th commissioned book, and uh, I think that ought to be enough for anyone. I think uh, Ecclesiastes says, of making many books, there is no end. And I always have that in <laughs> mind every time I start another one. Well, but, the, the um, current one, is yeah. is that the Pillars of Enoch or...? That's the next one to come out. That's, uh, that'll be out uh, at the end of this year, The Lost Pillars of Enoch, uh, which right. is an exciting book. And then I've just finished another one. It'll be the last of my Alistair Crowley biographies. Uh, it's called Alistair Crowley in England. And uh, that rounds up 
that adventure. Well, and now I've I've read one of your books on Alistair Crowley, and I, I highly recommend those books to um, to people as well because it gives gives a person a greater understanding of the man and what he was about as opposed to the um, nasty stories that have been you know circulated about him. And uh, I have a greater appreciation of Crowley because of the book that you wrote and. Um, the one we're going to be talking about today, The Mysteries of John the Baptist. Um, it, yes, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm particularly fond of this book, The Mysteries of John the Baptist. It's quite a long time now since I wrote it. I think it's about eight years ago. And um, But, you know, if, if there were certain books I'd hope to get into heaven on, that would be one of them. I, re- I really do think I was, I, I, I had a kind of extraordinary sense of guidance um, when I was writing it, which really means I was just was sticking to the truth and uh, opened myself to whatever was coming my way and, and looking at it seriously. It was great. It was great to come to something that people think they know about. Everybody's seen movies about John the Baptist with Charlton Heston wearing a sort of bearskin rug around himself and they're always <laughs> these sort of mighty, mighty men knee deep in or waist deep in water. And it, it, there's such an image of John the Baptist, it was marvelous to 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 recap to. I felt really for the first time to go back and have a look at this figure as an individual figure, not as a side man for the Jesus story, but uh, to see him as he was in his time. He, even in the Bible, uh, in the Gospels, uh, Jesus says, "No greater man was ever born of woman than John the Baptist." My goodness, this is. This is something, an extraordinary statement. If you've got um, well, he, Jesus' five-star approval, somebody, and yet he's, he's become theologically ignored. He's just, um, he's just part of the, part of the he, you know, he's, he's, he's become a bit player when, in fact, he was a star. That's, that's what came across through the book, and, and the more I read, the further you investigated, and you used the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you used, of course, Josephus, and you found historical evidence that that gave one the the a greater understanding of the man and and not just you know this this guy that was in the wilderness and that he dunked people in the water and then Jesus got baptized and took onto his whatever but it, it there's so much more to him than that and not only that but I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to disrespect the Bible, but you brought out a fact that 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 I think everybody should be aware of. That that each of the books of the Bible were never intended to be strung together in one book. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean that's. So, um, yeah, it's a bit like saying if you took um, five leading daily newspapers and then. Um, glued them all together and said that was the daily paper well people on the new york times would not want to be associated with the washington post and or with the national Enquirer. so it, and the, the the gospels are are separate sources they share things in common as in fact of all newspapers uh but no they were they were each one was produced with with a very separate kind of uh, they wouldn't have been written if they hadn't have been uh, people weren't wanting a particular kind of viewpoint. Um, so while we've tried to harmonize them, the, there's been a great price of historical veracity in trying to harmonize these different points of view. I mean, one of the amazing things, I'll give you just an example. The latest, the last gospel to appear, which is the one called the Gospel of John, which I argue was originally called John because uh, it, it contains John the Baptist's words. But uh, the Gospel of John refers constantly in Greek to hoi eudaioi, meaning the Jews. And there's constant statements about the Jews this and the Jews that. Now, considering all these stories happened in a, uh, a Jewish context, it's an extraordinary thing that the writer, by the, by the end of the first century, referred to the Jews as if they were a foreign people, whereas, in fact, the, mm-hmm. the original events are entirely within the Jewish uh, orientation. So, you know, they all have a particular, that's just one of many, many, many differential details. 
And each one differs in its account of John the Baptist as well. And, and we get what we find in the gospel. I, I say that the gospels are a, a kind of palimpsest. I don't know if you know what a palimpsest is. It's an old manuscript on which has, you see a piece of writing, but in fact has been written over another piece of writing, which has been rubbed out because parchment was so expensive. So they used to rub out stuff and then write another thing over it. And the Gospels are like a palimpsest. We have a writing about the history, but the real history is like underneath it. But you have to search for it. And uh, when you search for it, you not only find meaning that you wouldn't have expected in the accepted story, but you, you, you also find that the story that's come down to us has been highly wo rewoven to suit uh, the, the messengers, uh, the, the evangelists, um, for whom history, as we understand it, had no real meaning. The only history they cared about was Jesus appeared, walked on water, and saved um, his followers. And that's all they're bothered about. They're not bothered about who the emperor was. You know, they don't get a look in. But if you were there at the time, that would have been a, the major thing was, what are the Romans doing this morning? That would have been the big question. And John the Baptist, much more than Jesus, is a real historical figure. I, do, I don't mean that Jesus didn't exist historically. I'm saying that the evidence for John the Baptist's political reality is actually very clear, whereas uh, the people were writing about Jesus after his death. People were considering John the Baptist in his lifetime as being politically significant, as Josephus his account of John the Baptist makes abundantly clear. He's, he's a very vivid historical personality appearing at a very critical time in, in the history of uh, Judea. Well, and you, you do go into, and this is what I love about what you've done here, you have really provided the historical um, evidence and, and the times with, with the person. So you've made him more real, than than the Bible does because the Bible just basically has him in there to baptize and then you know then he gets his head cut off and that's the end of John, but um, and, and I think what what is fascinating is that you have you have brought forth through the histor through the history and and I, I'd like you to kind of go into a little bit about John because he he really. I, I, there's no way that he was. Let's let, let me put it another way. His, they talk about him, you know, in the wilderness and and living on on locusts and honey and and all of that. But the reality is, he he was more more educated. He was more intelligent. He was he was not a crazy wild man. He rubbed elbows with royalty. And in order to be able oh. to do that, you know, he, he couldn't have been this wild man. No, I think, the, 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 again, it's the old problem of image, isn't it? Uh, the, his image creators after his death have done a nice piece of work on him and created this figure with it. But all the accounts of his dress that are, occur in the New Testament are entirely lifted from the account of Elijah in the Old Testament. And this is a theological lift because um, they had to justify uh, what his role, the gospel writers had to justify what John's real role was in, in God's providential saving uh, uh, experience. And they came to the conclusion that he was the announcer of the Messiah. And the announcer of the Messiah was often thought to be Elijah. Elijah, who had gone disappeared off the earth fully alive in a fiery chariot, according to the book, books of Kings. Um, he goes off in a fiery chariot, and, you know, for all we know, he's, he was still there. And it was believed that Elijah would come back. And when Elijah came back, either Elijah would basically be the Messiah, or he would announce the Messiah, or his coming back would be the sign that the God's chosen Messiah was about to come. So they took the dress of Elijah, uh, which is right down to the details uh, of the, the furriness and all that, and the girdle, and uh, they, they put that on John to make him like um, Elijah. And they even put John in places where Elijah famously operated. 
And we know that Elijah, of course, uh, if you remember right, is a, is a Baptist. He uses water as a spiritual symbol, the Jordan. Mm-hmm. So um, the picture of him of, as this pe- person who lived in the desert, I, I think is really ridiculous uh, if you take it too far. The background to John, as far as we can tell, is that he was, uh, he was one of the poorer priesthood. Um, at that time in the temple in, in Jerusalem, there was a tremendous battle going on between different groups of priests. We get, a, we get a hint of this in the Gospels about disagreements between Sadducees and Pharisees, and the Sadducees tending to favor the Herodian dynasty, who were foreigners, and the Pharisees uh, more connected with the common people. And Jesus debates with all of them, as, as we have in the New Testament. But um, there was they, these priests actually had physical fights, according to Josephus. There were riots among them uh, because the richer priests uh, were, wanted to keep the status quo, which was maintained by Roman army. And there were the poorer priests who wanted to live in a prophetic spiritual purity. And the, of those of that number, I think both Jesus and John were included, and I think they came from priestly families. Every, everything about Jesus' background suggests he was of, of a priestly family, and probably a priest himself, and John almost certainly a priest. I think the, his natural raiment would have been the white linen of, of, of the priesthood. Going into the wilderness for a period was, was just something people did at that time as a, as a ritual purification exercise, and the, the model for that was Judas Maccabeus, Judas, the Maccabean warrior who had purified himself in, in the 160s BC, had uh, gone out in the desert and lived on wild herbs, locusts, and, and all the things he could find. And that wilderness diet uh, was regarded as a sign of holiness. So if John wanted to, rep, uh, if he wanted to identify himself with the spiritual dreams of his people, he would have had to go into the wilderness, as, of course, the story has Jesus doing the same thing, uh, where he's tempted but also supported by, by characters called angels in the, in the Gospels. But all this is quite, quite reasonably historical. Um, but, no, he's not, he's not a bloke who comes out of a cave you know, one million years B.C., and he's in no sense wild. The appeal he made to the people of, 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 of Judea was enormous. It apparently had a massive following. Herod uh, Antipas, who was ruling Galilee, was very much afraid of the power, uh, political and social intellectual power that, that John wielded. And uh, he was, even in the Gospels, he's, he's loath to put a, uh, a restraint or arrest John. And he only does so eventually, of course, because he's persuaded by his uh, horrible Herodias, you know, and you have the story of the, the maiden dancing uh, for the head of John the Baptist. Um, there's, of course, so much more to that story, which I go into in the oh, book. Yeah. Uh, but he's a, he, John's a political figure. I think you'd compare him to, in English history, would be some, someone like Thomas More. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen A Man for All Seasons, Henry VIII, Thomas More stands yeah. against Henry VIII, who wants to take control of the church, and says, no, no, uh, I'm with you so far, but this far, further than that, you will not go. And Henry reluctantly has him executed, but he knows he's executed a good man. And Josephus says this about the Jewish historian, Josephus, who was a Roman quiz, uh, a pro-Roman quisling. He'd switch sides from the rebellion to the Romans, to the house of the Flavian, the Flavian dynasty. And he lived in Rome. And he, 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 he also reckoned that, that John was one of the good men. Uh, and an exemplary uh, character. So we have a historical testimony. Well, I think one of the things you point out, too, is is during that time frame, and certainly again in England, that beheading was, was really something that was uh, reserved for nobility. So yes, that if, it was, it, uh, if, because it was quick. Yeah, it's, well, yeah, and, and so it having him beheaded... It isn't, of course, done by amateurs in the Middle East today, yeah, yeah, no, but it it just it it seems that that just the way that he was killed, aside from the fact that her mother told her to request the head of John the Baptist, but but I mean when he was put in prison, he wasn't really put in prison; he was restricted no, I, I, to I make that clear. Yes, it, yeah. this is something that yeah he wasn't he wasn't chucked into jail. 
he was he was you would call it today house arrest, but it was like being house arrested in Buckingham Palace. He was he was sent to Machiris, which was Herod Antipas's summer castle, and uh, uh, it it may have had a, a cellar, a dungeon of some sort, but. I think the, the 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 all the implication is is that he was simply that one about you know keep your enemies closer. Uh, John was a uh-huh. house guest of Herod, Herod Antipas. Uh, the problem was that uh, Herod Antipas was determined to divorce uh, his wife Phasilis, who is not mentioned in the Bible, but she's certainly mentioned in Josephus. Phasilis was the daughter of the king of Nabatea, Aretas the Fourth, just south of uh, of um, of Machiris. And John would then have been to Herod Antipas, uh, a potential ally of his enemy, Aretas IV, who is mentioned, by the way, in Paul's letters, um, because Aretas invaded uh, that part of the territory and uh, took the Decapolis, the Ten Towns. And when Paul uh, goes to the Ten Towns to proclaim, uh, to arrest the followers of Jesus, um, he's actually on Aretas's territory. Aretas had won the war. Uh, Herod Antipas lost it, even though Tiberius had said, and this is very interesting, Tiberius, the emperor, had said that uh, to Herod Antipas, I want Aretas's head. And that might be the origin of the head of John the Baptist story, because we don't know actually uh, exactly how he was executed. And you have the Bible story of the head, uh, but that might be a romance. Um, he was executed anyway by order of the king, so he was probably beheaded. Uh, but he's a, he's a political figure. And, and it's, it's very interesting. And even in the Gospels, you have the account that Herod Antipas is convinced when he hears about Jesus that, in fact, Jesus is John the Baptist returned. I mean, that gives ah. you an idea. Well, it appears also that John the Baptist had a larger following than Jesus did oh, he- in the very beginning. Well, Jesus nicks his following, doesn't he? <laughs> he takes it over. Yes. <laughs> uh, every, every, virtually everything Jesus has to preach in the Gospels is, is, has already been preached by John. And this gives you the idea either, I mean, there are several possibilities there exist in, in assessing the historical uh, weight of, of those um, narratives. Uh, John is the original. He's the one um, uh, with the message of repentance, uh, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand uh, is John's message. Uh, Jesus takes it over verbatim in in the Gospels, and it is also convenient, isn't it? It's rather convenient that John is executed, so Jesus takes over. There's uh, something very peculiar about this, in a way. Um, now, certainly they- understated. Were they related? Because I, I've read in a number of places that they were cousins, or that they were related, and that in, in well, many ways they, good. you know, they worked in conjunction. Well, I think uh, if you ask me my opinion, not what I know, but what I think might have been most likely, my money would probably be on the idea that in fact they were a, a concerted. Uh, effort of the of the poorer priesthood uh, against the ruling party, and that they were in some sense working together. But there are, um, I mean, there are indications of that. Obviously, you have this great chunk of Luke, and it all comes from Luke, who's sometimes called the Romantic Gospel. You have all this chunk of stuff about um, about John's father Zechariah and his mother Elizabeth, and that they have a sort of country dasher out in the country mm-hmm. and that Elizabeth knows Jesus' mother, um, which would suggest to me that they were they were priestly families who, who knew each other. Mary or Marianne, I've identified in my book, the uh, lost family of Jesus was a temple slave. Uh, she was a temple slave who, ma- who was married to an old priest, Joseph, uh, would have been the old priest, and they were allowed to take their wives uh, from from the temple slaves, so the temple is the is the is the nexus. It's the is the center point of, in which they would have met Yeshua Ben Yosef uh, Bar Yosef, Bar Yosef, I should say, and uh, oh Ben, you know Ben Ben Ben's fine Ben Yosef, yeah, 
Uh, and and John, uh, John, uh, God comforts is the meaning of his name. Um, they are priestly families. That's where they're coming from. And uh, I think they were working in, in some form of uh, communion. Um, John appears to have been the primary leader at this point. All this stuff about I am not fit to uh, undo the sandals, um, you know, all this is from Paul. Now, you've got, when you look at John the Baptist, you have to realize that whatever the primitive message of Jesus and John might have been, Paul, uh, Saul originally, produced another version of it. And in his version of the original message, he fell out with Peter famously, we know, in the, according to uh-huh. the Acts of the Apostles, the, the letters of, of Paul are full of fulminations that his ministry is superior to, well, to anybody's. And Paul took the view that John's baptism was inadequate. Now, I address this in the book, um, this idea that he, he, you, you get it in, in, in John, I think, where Paul, um, John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Well, why? 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 Why should John decrease? Well, <laughs> he wasn't there to, to, to argue with it by the time those words were written. In fact, it was Paul who said that John, he'd met followers of John. There were, he had a big following, not only in, in Judea, but also in uh, the wider empire. In Corinth, we hear of this character, Apollos, who was from Alexandria, presumably a Jewish intellectual from Alexandria, who'd heard John and had followers. And uh, Paul says, ah, but you haven't got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and the followers of Apollos say, well, what's that? And he says, well, it's, it's, it's very superior to what John... And this is all... This, people take this on trust. But I would like to ask the question, if John's baptism was inadequate, which Paul plainly says it was and condemns anyone who doesn't agree with him, uh, if he, his baptism was inadequate, how is it that Jesus goes to John to be baptized. And even in Luke's account, uh, which is rather fanciful, and you have the dove of the Holy Spirit coming down at the moment of of Jesus' baptism, and the voice of the Father who says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, Even at that moment, uh, it is John's baptism, which is the, the, encourages the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I, I, I cannot help but think that uh, all the accounts of Jesus himself baptizing, which also exist in the Gospel of John, John and his disciples baptized. There are various contradictory yeah. statements about it. They were all doing this baptism thing. What was it baptism for? Baptism was a common rite for washing away one's sins and turning to God. In other words, reorienting, reorienting yourself to the demands of holiness because it was thought that only if you remain holy would you survive the coming uh, conflagration or day of the Lord, the Yom Yahweh, Yom Yahweh. And, and it is the coming day of the Lord that John preaches first, not Jesus, John does. It's his message. Repent is his message. Sell all you have and give it to the poor is John's message. John's message has all the social teaching that you find uh, which we call Christian. It's all there in John's message. So Jesus never deviates from it. He never says a word against it. Whatever Jesus' role, now I have a sneaking suspicion that this was a king-priest double act. And I mean by act, and don't take that too, too literally. Uh, there is the view, comes in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the, there might be two messiahs, a priest and a king. And in which case... Uh, I would imagine that John would have played the priest and, and Jesus the king, and they'd have had a, a council of 12 around them. So I would have imagined that in the historical facts that the death of John was a total blow to, uh, as big a blow to Jesus, perhaps, as they say the murder of John Lennon was to the residual movement of the 1960s, uh, of the psychedelic uh, cosmic change uh, movement. Um, which still happily refuses to give up the ghost. 
but, the, but well, there's no there's no doubt in my view that that John was a kind of John Lennon of his time. Well, what doesn't it, in I fact, mean, actually, it, it was John Lennon who, who identified with John the Baptist famously. That's right. He used to write letters. He write, wrote letters to his dear friend Stuart Sutcliffe, and they they had this very high level sensibility that they would come somehow called into the world which would involve a certain amount of suffering and um i, I think religious people have this uh, very spiritually minded people have this sense of being called and the price of the call is as in the the prophecies of isaiah about the suffering servant to be called to divine service almost certainly means you're going to come into contact with the blindness that exists in the the ignorant uh, aspect of this planet then then literally Christianity as we know it today could not have existed unless John and Jesus were were dead and in order for that to happen it feels like and you do kind of hint at it that the Paul may well have been partially responsible for the death of both of them in order for him to become the head of a major religion that is that has you know um, survived to this day. Well, I, I don't want to. I don't speculate on on that kind of level. I look at the evidence, see what's going on, and and try to assess it with a certain humility that I may be missing something of greater importance, which may be perfectly apparent to anybody listening. Uh, that that's always the case. I I may have missed something. I do think it is fair to say that without any shadow of a doubt that in a court of law, if you ask Paul to his face, would you go to John for salvation? He would say no. And that is clearly not the historical uh, situation. That is a position which favors Paul, who had the advantage that he was alive. Uh, also, everybody forgets this about Paul. They you go to any number of churches and you'll hear the letters of Paul read as if they were written to be holy writ and they can never be touched. You know, they apparently had, you know, he didn't write them. Oh my God, he, he didn't write these letters. They all came from God and through his mouth in some uh, supernatural way. They were letters written for the moment. They've been, they've been tampered with over time a bit, uh, like all historical stuff. Uh, as it were. But anyway, the, the fact of the matter is, is, is that Paul thought that John didn't, get it what john didn't get well of course he wasn't alive to get it because what paul is saying is that it was the crucifixion of jesus which was the absolute mystery that caused and is the cause of salvation and john as far as we know uh is not espousing that view but of course it could be that john kept that idea to himself it's very interesting that nobody regards John's murder by the king of, uh, uh, of Galilee, uh, Herod Antipas, as a salvific event. And yet, in, the, in Josephus' writings, he says that when Antipas lost the war against, um, uh, when, he lo when he lost the war against uh, Aretas of Nabatea, it was because he had killed John the Baptist. That was the public belief that that that, um, that John's death had affected history, and that's very very interesting. And that, but that isn't recorded in the in the in the Gospels. It, it, it's it's very very interesting statement. People had the belief that that by killing John that, that he had he had changed history. Now, Paul obviously believed that killing uh, Jesus changed history in a different way and, and so on. But um, it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? You really would like to put Paul and John in the same room and, and listen to what they had to say to each other. Would Paul have said, you didn't get the true message, you had to go? <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, well, Paul was very argumentative. He argues with Peter, you know, on, on whose rock the Catholic Church is built. Uh, Paul tells Peter he doesn't know what he's talking about. He hasn't had the personal experience of Jesus appearing in his spirit. Uh, he boasts in 2 Corinthians that he's been raised to the third heaven and has seen things which ordinary people can't possibly understand. Um, 
you know, Paul make, is, a, is, a, is the greatest spokesman for himself. And yet he will always say, but I am nothing. I would rather be of the dust. You know, I would rather be swept away. Uh, rather, you know, I will be as a, a fool to a man. I will be anything to a man. Yeah, and then he says, but of course, anyone who disagrees with me is accursed. This is, but, this. but it should so I mean, Christianity, in, in, Christianity it, has been called Paulianity, hasn't it? Christianity has been called Paulianity. Uh, it, yeah. Because the, relig- the doctrine of Christianity is so evidently Pauline. The crucifixion is the main event. You, get, you enter the mystery of being baptized in the blood of the Lamb. And this has nothing to do with the expectations of ordinary Jewish people. Uh, at the time, they weren't expecting to be baptized in the blood of the Lamb. They were expecting that God would come and put the world to rights in the same way that Jehovah's Witnesses do today. They just thought that, you know, God had had enough of sin and he'd, he'd, he'd sent the flood before and now he was going to send his son to create a, a, a paradise. Um, you know, so, you know it's, 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 we, we, Christianity is many, many stories and every every how can i say I mean, religion is a mess isn't it <laughs> you know, if you look at if you look at religion well, as I, a whole in the world and and, and look at its its foundation documents and and so on you do realize that it's it's been able to survive thanks to the ignorance of uh, of its followers largely and the intelligence of its intelligence bracket who are very smart at uh, at uh, dealing with, with, with dissenters like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at you Paul. Can always, to, you can always didn't, ignore didn't, them. You know. did, didn't Paul go to the disciples and ask to be taught how to do all of the things that they were doing? Uh, I, I don't know of any account that he actually, he, he claims that he got nothing whatsoever from meeting James, uh, James that's Jesus' his brother, who was the yeah. head of the church in the early church in Jerusalem. Uh, I he, think he says he got nothing at all. He didn't, he, did, he didn't need the disciples. His view of the disciples was they don't really get it. I mean, I think Paul is one of the great salesmen of all time. He takes, he takes a Jewish esoteric movement uh, into the empire and turns it into a multinational enterprise. He, is, he turned out that he was the rock on which the church was built. Poor old Peter hardly got a look at well, yeah, and I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize in that there wasn't, it didn't, it, it wasn't just one Christian movement, it was many. And, and was it, was it, and, and eventually they became blended together to a certain extent. Um, I don't think a, they ever got blended, I don't, I don't think they ever got blended together. That was a forced, uh, forced, forced movement. Um, it's a bit like, I, in our own experience, perhaps, depending on how old our listeners are, um, it's a bit like the 60s. For a time, it looked like all the, all the different dissenting movements, uh, if you saw them in a group, it, it were all of one mind and part of a common, uh, common front. But, but soon you, you, you find the differences. I mean, you, the yippies tried to bring left-wing politics into the hippie movement, Jerry Rubin, Abby, Abby Hoffman, that sort of thing. And, and, and a lot of the hippies didn't really like this, you know, Marxist stuff, very theoretical, uh, very unpleasure oriented. And, uh, you know, the whole thing splits off. There was a moment, there was a moment when it could have crystallized, uh, but it never happened. Uh, and as you say, Christianity, the religion of the ancient world, peppered off into various parts of the world and developed in very, very idiosyncratic ways. The, the Gnostic movement is uh-huh. remarkable, uh, remarkable insofar as it's uh, contrary to what its uh, enemies predicted. It has survived and survives today, though uh, it's always had this flexibility. Whereas we see uh, the Catholic religion uh, is nowadays its largest number of adherents tend to, tend to be people uh, who do not feel confident to think or criticize the the foundation of the religion. In other words, it's a it's a it's an act of devotion. Uh, it's a devotional. It's become a devotional religion, not a, not really a thinking one. I'm not saying there's no thinking. That would be insulting to perfectly perfectly clever uh, a Catholic priest. 
but its greatest appeal is to the person seeking uh, a magical devotional uh, feeling and a sense of belonging. Um, mm -hmm. Now, whether whether that was what Jesus was preaching in, in actual fact is very different. But I, I you know, it, uh, it, it, I, it, 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 yeah, go on. Are there are there still groups of people that that really um, revere um, John John the Baptist? And, yes, you know, yes, there, yes, yes, you know yes, yes. the the Masons yeah, yeah, and yeah, the yeah, Saint yeah, John's yeah. men. Is, is there well, still? I, I, is yeah. there? Yes. No. Uh, is there I, still? I, I, um, I, I delineate in the book there are three three main groups today uh, for whom John the Baptist is still a significant figure. Uh, by far the most important are the Mandeans, uh, the Mandeans from the word Manda, which means knowledge. Um, used to be called John Christians by Catholic uh, missionaries to, to <laughs> ridiculous idea really, Catholic missionaries to the Middle East, to what is now Iraq. Um, the Mandeans have been practicing uh, a religion of baptism in the Tigris and Euphrates in Iraq since uh, we must uh, presume that at least the first century. They claim John as a major figure in their history. They call him the man of light. They say he could not be burned. And they have a book associated with, uh, named after him, in which John reveals a, a mystical revelation to the Mandeans. Mandeans, I think, are the most authentic um, group, other than, I suppose, mainstream Judaism from the first century. Uh, but rabbinic Judaism of today is a development after after uh, the events we're describing, which are the first half of the first century. I think the Mandeans deserve the most profound respect and study, and uh, they 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 practice the baptism, and they were persecuted. They've been persecuted mercilessly since um, since Saddam Hussein's uh, removal. Uh, one of the consequences of the Iraq War was to expose the Mandeans to the predations of extreme Islamic fanatics who have lost no opportunity in attacking the Mandeans. And they're now, the largest number of them are now spread around the world in where they can, if they can find somewhere to practice their baptismal rites. They have their own literature, their own liturgy, their own philosophy. And I urge anybody who wants to have a sense, if they want to get in touch with an authentic uh, spiritual tradition to, to find out about the Mandeans. Um, why, why, why people don't know more about them, I can only put it down to the ignorance of our broadcasters and so forth who seem to think that uh, they don't need to know these sorts of things. But the Mandeans are very important. Freemasonry, interestingly, has a very strong place for John the Baptist. The 24th of June, which is the John the Baptist Day, as I go, in, go into in the book, why? was the great feast of, of Freemasons. And I think I go into the various reasons why that is. He's the Lord of the summer. He's become associated with, with the harvest and uh, fertility, which is also very interesting. Um, and the other group, of course, was the Knights Templar who, uh, and, and, and the Knights Hospitaller as well. The medieval knightly orders had great respect for John. And um, it, it's a very interesting as to why. Uh, if we can, we would like to know more about what John seems to represent a, a special place within the Christian tradition, rather like Mary Magdalene, that you can, if you find the sort of top heavy doctrine a bit harsh, you can sort of take comfort on these sort of, uh, these other little ports. There's one called Mary Magdalene, who we know very little about, but that gives us an opportunity to speculate and find another alternative spiritual path. And I think John also has that power. Uh, the idea also of the, in the Middle Ages, the idea of the severed head as containing the life of a person was also a, a strong superstition. Um, the head was associated with the, the, the spirit of the man. So the fact that his head, you know, you have these relics around European cathedrals all claiming to be John the Baptist's head. And, there's, and, and there was one in Aleppo uh, the main, the, mo the, the strongest claimant for John the Baptist head actually was, has been pretty well destroyed in the war in Syria in the last few years. We do seem to be destroying our 
religious artifacts with an incredible rate, with the confidence of the idiocy of, of our times. But um, yes, yeah, so John the Baptist has a following. And anyway, I would say that anybody who, who follows the Christian so-called social gospel, that, that it is right to think well of your neighbor and uh, shield the weak from oppression, is following John's gospel. Well, I think one of the things that, that fascinated me that you pointed out that he couldn't have been the wild man in the desert and be John the Baptist because there's no water in the desert. So Exactly. Absolutely right. You know, and it's one of the jokes is the, the, the desert. The, the, yes, the essence of the desert is there is no uh, access to water uh, except in rare places. And he didn't, he didn't baptize at Oasis. He was baptizing on, in the Jordan. Um, but he, he lived outside the city. And I think well, the word wilderness practically, in, in, it's only a very small country in Judea anyway, uh, but the, the wilderness is practically is basically somewhere that doesn't have a public road and, uh, and, 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 in, and, and large towns. That's really what wilderness means. Well, could the it also be... John's, it's a symbol. Could it all, yeah, the I was going to say... Yeah, the voice crying in the wilderness is a spiritual symbol. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize, that there is so much more symbolism in the Bible than people actually understand. And, and, yeah. and, it, it's, it's, and one has to wonder, is that symbolism there because it was actually there, or was it put in as the Bible was being composed to give a different message symbolically to the literal message they were being handed. I, I personally would take the view that it is it is our good fortune and, and, and an act of providence that, uh, that the symbolic value of so many of the stories carries the spiritual message for those who uh, look beneath the surface. Those who are interested in a superficial uh, materialist viewpoint on everything, of course, will never see the wood for the trees. Uh, you know, they can't get the sap they're obsessed with. And, uh, you know, I found that the, so much theological discourse is, has been perpetrated by people who, who cannot see, you know, the, the, the beauty of these symbols. The voice crying in the wilderness is, is a classic one, really. Because it's it's really about the creation of the world. It's the word the word made flesh. This this spiritual link with God only becomes real to us when there is nothing else. You have to go into a place of absence to find the presence of God. Exactly. N now, you you made another really good point in the book, and uh, you know the. The three for the for the um, resurrection for for the transfiguration the the three days um, you know you went into a great deal about the symbolic use of the three days and it wasn't necessarily three days that he rose and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I was. I'm really. Yeah, that's a very, very. You, I'm afraid that's one of those things that you need to meditate on and follow in the book and think about. I, this is a book that I wrote, but I go back to it to understand it myself. I have to reacquaint myself because in the writing of it, I was uh, taken to uh, certain certain insights that are not easily held in your memory, as if they were little facts. They're, they're, they're levels of perception. And the book has these, but you, you, you've really got to read the book to understand why I re, uh, reinterpreted the story of the resurrection. But it's much easier to talk about the other things in the book where, for example, I finally come up with a historical date for the crucifixion of 37 AD, to, uh, seven years after the generally, the generally accepted, mindlessly accepted 30 AD uh, or 33. Um, all the history points to to uh, a crucifixion of 37 AD, and that John uh, didn't wasn't dead until 36. 
Now, if he wasn't dead until 36, then the crucifixion couldn't have happened in 30 to 33 AD. Uh, the, the citing of his death is very plainly put by Josephus as it takes place um, uh, in the context of the war with Aretas IV over his daughter Facilis, who is being divorced so that uh, Herod Antipas can marry Herodias. Um, and uh, he wants to reclaim Herodias' hus late husband's territory, uh, uh, Philip's tetrarchy. Um, and by marrying Herodias, he would, he would, he would improve, his, improve his kingdom. And this is what brings about war, and it is the war which is the, the cause of the death of John the Baptist, not um, the story about the, the nymph who dances. It was the war that was the problem. <laughs> war isn't even mentioned in the New Testament. And so that's just the price you pay for putting doctrine before facts. You know, the, the actual setting of, of these events in the New Testament, you'd think they were happening. If you watch all the movies, Greatest Story Ever Told, Max von Sydow, they, these people walking around Judea as if they were walking around the, wild, uh, the West, you know, but Utah or something on a, on a bright day. There's, there's no tension. You see the odd Roman soldier, but you, you don't think in terms of war preparedness and, and, and violence and, and, and rapaciousness. And, and the enormous social and uh, social and religious instability, you, you you barely get an insight into that. I think those lovely words attributed to Jesus about you know look at the lilies of the field, you know was Solomon in all his glory arrayed as one of these has given the kind of Sunday school view that the Holy Land was sort of picturesque, whereas in fact it was a combination of a military training place, uh, uh, great violence, and and also a massive building site. Huge amount of building going on. Uh, there were masons all over the place, and uh, because because the influence of, of Rome, you, you got with Rome came the builders. Well, I, I think, I think was, to, when yeah. when Rome conquered any particular area, they were really pretty good about allowing the people to continue the, <clears throat> their religious observances. Well, I mean, they, they continue they, under yes. Yeah. Yes, but in the case of the Jews, the, the, the high priest's robes were kept under lock and key in the Tower of Antonia, which o literally overlooked the temple. Can you imagine what, a, what, a, what a, a thing that was if you were a priest of the old school in the temple? And this temple, by the way, had been built by somebody who wasn't even a Jew. Uh, Herod uh, was an Idumean uh, prince who'd, who'd made friends with Mark Antony, and by, by making friends with Mark Antony, had got hold of uh, got hold of Judea and uh, married into the Maccabean Jewish uh, aristocracy and then murdered all the Jewish aristocrats he could get hold of. Jesus, in, in my view, uh, was, was certainly a, 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 of the aristocracy, the old aristocracy of Judea. Herod, the, the, the story of the massacre of the innocents we, we hear at Christmas, I think is is pretty historical. If it's, if it's not directly historical, I think it gives, a, it gives an image of just how vicious uh, Herod, the old bastard, was uh, when he took control, thanks to Roman power. And what kept him in power were the Romans. What kept his sons, Arist uh, Aristobulus, Herod Antipas, Herod Agrippa, what kept them in power was the Romans. Uh, the, Judea was a Roman thing. Um, they, were, they, were, they had a circus maximus, uh, you know, chariot races in, in Judea. Uh, naked men doing athletics. I mean, the, the old Jews were absolutely horrified by this, this pagan stuff going on and these big buildings and eagles being erected by the temple. I mean, there were regular riots. You know, it was really uh, extraordinary situation. And, and in, the, in the context, as you see in the book, the crucifixion of Jesus was almost a done thing, as if Jesus and how many others, Paul himself, murdered as many followers of Yeshua ben Yosef as he could, and he's proud of it. You know, he, he says, I did, I, as far as he was concerned, he was doing the Lord's work. He goes all the way to the Decapolis with God knows what right, because he, he, it wasn't uh, under Roman rule. It was under Aretas' rule uh, to, to bring out the followers of this, this heretic. You know, it's an extraordinary story, the whole thing. So by de getting the right date for Jesus' crucifixion, which is 37 AD, when we have 
We know that Herod Antipas is in Jerusalem because he's supporting Vitellius, the Roman general, uh, the legate of Syria, who's come down to fight a war with Aretas. They're marching through the holy territory of Judea. He calls in at Jerusalem and makes concessions to the Jewish um, uh, hierarchy, uh, priestly hierarchy, and says, if you behave yourselves, I'll let you have the priest's robes at the Tower of Antonia. Now, I think this is the, the setting for all the stuff about, you know, uh, we want Barabbas and all that, where you have Pontius Pilate watching uh, a debate about whether he should execute Jesus or, so, or perhaps somebody else. I think the, the real setting is Vitellius is March south. Vitellius called in at Jerusalem for three days, uh, as, as Josephus informs us, and uh, this is the setting. And that, that would have been the time when people said to uh, Pilate or to Vitellius, we want no other king but Caesar. Now, why would they say this? Well, the reason was, was the emperor Tiberius had just been, well, died, they said, but he'd been murdered, of course, by Macro, the head of the Praetorian Guard. That news had just reached the Middle East. This was catastrophic news. The emperor is dead. Now, a pilot had already been condemned for being heavy-handed, dealing with insurrection. And he was supposed to go to Tiberius, which probably meant a very miserable experience. But when the emperor died, his, his, his will ceases to operate. And until Caligula was in place, who was his successor, Gaius Caligula, little boots, uh, the position of pilot is, is ambiguous. He's not sure whether he's going to be reappointed prefect over Judea. And therefore, he can't make a, he's in an awkward position trying to decide whether Jesus should suffer the same face as John the Baptist the year before. And by the way, he wasn't called John the Baptist. That's our word. He was just known as John and was regarded as the prophet of the time, the prophet. And uh, uh, Pilate has to make a decision. And I think it's because Vitellius, the Roman legate from Syria, is watching with his armor, army. Her Herod Antipas is down there very peculiarly in the gospel stories. Why is Herod Antipas doing in Judea? He's the governor of Galilee. Judea is run by the Romans. Uh, directly through Pilate. Galilee is run by Herod Antipas. Why has he got armed men in Jerusalem? Well, if you read Josephus, it's absolutely plain. He joins Vitellius, and they're about to go down south to fight a war in Nabatea to revenge, uh, to avenge the, uh, the invasion of the Decapolis by Aretas IV. And, of course, it all comes to a standstill because Tiberius is killed. And in that confusion of that moment, I believe you have the, the the absolute cookie the recipe for the crucifying of Yeshua, Jesus. Uh, I, it makes I utter wanna, sense in context. Yeah, I want to I want to go to the crucifixion for just a second because you you mentioned something in the book that I thought was fabulous. Well, I thought it was interesting. Fabulous, maybe not. Well, but I'll, very I'll interesting. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I sat there with my mouth hanging open a little bit. You mentioned that the, the freeing of um, someone who was um, um, condemned to die on the eve of, of some holiday or whatever it was didn't exist. And you, that's instead right. of... That's right. The Barabbas story. It, is, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, tell the Barabbas story because that's a, that's a good one. No, no, you, you tell me what you remember of it because it's probably better, more than I do. I, I, I don't remember every detail of this. Well, well, the only the only thing that I really remember is that Barabbas is is really probably not that what what they were calling they were calling for justice, and that word a referee. Yeah, I think that, that yeah there was a Greek word um, which sounds like Barabbas, um, and it, it was a cry for a referee of referee's judgment, and I, yeah. I I suspect the trial of Jesus had become a kind of like a game, a football game, popular mob thing. And, they, and they're, what they're really asking for is make a decision, make a decision, make a decision. I think that's what that's, that's, they were actually tempting uh, Pilate to make a decision. I don't think Pilate at that time was very worried about his reputation. He'd been condemned by the Senate of the Samaritans for having uh, um, massacred with great cruelty a public demonstration at Tirathaba, uh on the Samaria-Judea border. 
um, and he'd murdered a load of people, and he said, kill, kill all strong men, and so on. And, and these people were followers, possibly of Simon Magus, who had said that the, the Moses had left uh, remnants of the, of the of temple um, garments at Mount Gerizim, which is the holy mountain of Samaria. See, there's all this history going on. This is all real history. It's all real stuff. You won't find it in the Gospels. Anyway, Pilate's in deep shit. And, uh, sorry, mind my French. He's, he's in a lot of trouble. And uh, he doesn't know whether he's going to survive. And therefore, he doesn't want to make a decision, I think, about executing um, prophets. Because he knows that a prophet, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, um, it'd be like if the Americans had arrested the Ayatollah and carried him back to uh, wherever and, and put him on trial. You would have had the trial wouldn't have been worth the effort. The amount of stuff that would have gone with it would not have been worth that kind of effort. Yeah? You, you try to avoid that sort of thing. For example, when they, Saddam Hussein was captured by the Americans, but he's tried by the Iraqis. So the Americans wash their hands, exactly like Pilate washes his hands of Jesus' crucifixion. We, we arrest him, we know you're going to kill him, but it's not our fault. And the Jewish people at the time are saying, well, it's not really ours either, so we'll leave it to, well, you know. And so the whole thing is a great political fudge. And in, the, in that fudge, uh, Jesus is caught. Now, he hasn't had much of a ministry, as the uh, Christian, um, Christian story has it. He's, he's only had about a year, if that, to sort of make a mark, but you can do a lot in a year in, in a politically volatile situation. The the thing about the resurrection is terribly important. I, I do think the that to try and understand why the account of the resurrection is the way it is, and that it is a symbolic story based on the great prophecies of, of, of what we, for some reason, call the Old Testament, but for Jesus was the Testament. That was the testament on which he based his life. He did does nothing. Jesus never does a thing which isn't backed up by, by text in, in, in the Jewish scripture. And uh, it's Paul has the problem of trying to justify new religions, the Romans, because the Jews were hated for having rebelled against Rome. They were suspected. And by 138 AD, of course, well after Paul's time there, they're kicked out of Jerusalem altogether, the great diaspora. So uh, Christianity has to be founded upon a principle that it's different to the Jews. It's not Jewish even. So you get references to the Jews that I mentioned much earlier. And Jesus becomes much more of a superhuman um, ideal figure, a spiritual, uh, a spiritual symbol than a political or historical figure which is the real context, I think. The, the church couldn't possibly preach to the Roman and the Greek world um, that these people came from a liberation movement of their own country. And it wasn't acceptable. But such is the power of the symbolism inherent in the accounts, and such is the spiritual power and people's need of it, that, are, that Christianity will survive with all its stories and narratives i suspect perfectly intact and uh we people like you and i will be debating these things forever after and i expect that most of the priests will be most of the priests will be safe in their pews with declining congregations whether whether we are in a position now in the third millennium since these times to to create something new is is an interesting question. Well, don't you find it interesting that um, John the Baptist's death was um, more one, um, there was respect, there was the beheading, that was something that you did for nobility. And yet Jesus' death of crucifixion was more common so that in many ways, John the Baptist appears to have had more respect than Jesus did. Well, I, certainly on the, the basis of, of, yes, to be crucified was to be regarded as a sedition, as, as it was a terrible death. In, yeah. I mean, in every sense, it was a punishment 
for insurrectionists. And I can't help wondering about that, is the, as you have wondered. Um, that story that Pilate has, orders that uh, above the cross, king of the Jews, um, an exemplary punishment. In other words, uh, this is what Rome, or this is what the power of our times thinks of your king. You know, that's, it's such a, it's the most profound insult you could imagine. And um, you can only imagine, therefore, that in order to do it, Jesus must have had extraordinary enemies in the Sadducean party, in the the Herodian dynasty, uh, like Paul, perhaps. Well, Paul claims he was one of the enemies, and therefore I suspect strongly he he was personally involved in the crucifixion. Uh, It would explain uh, his peculiar obsession with it. He may well have been involved. If he, He's been identified as a relative of the Herodian dynasty, but this is on a name basis. Saulus is a relative of, of the Herodians. But it would make sense also because he's a Roman citizen, which he makes so much of, doesn't he? Saul of Tarsus, yes. Paul, Paulus, Paulus the, the Roman's friend who advocates that uh, Jews should pay their taxes and uh, that the Romans have been put there by God to to keep order and it's all well with God that the Romans exist. To, for, for a Jew to actually believe that at the time, when they were being their, their brethren were being crucified, bullied, thrown out their houses, highly taxed, and in every way subdued, by unless you 100% towed the line, uh, is an extraordinary thing. Paul never writes as a Jew. He claims that he's, he's, he's of one of the tribes, um, Benjamin, I think, he, he says, but uh, through, through what uh, parentage one, one, one wonders, uh, because he seems to utterly, utterly hate the Jewish popular movements of his time. I utterly hate them. Now, from our distance, that doesn't look too bad. He seems like maybe he was the sensible one, you know, he, he saw <laughs> what the zealots didn't. I can see that, well, you know. He wasn't a zealot. He, Josephus wasn't a zealot. He was, uh, sorry. Did, didn't Paul really aim more towards the Gentiles than the Jews? To convert well, them that, to alone, that alone is the most extraordinary thing for somebody who claims to be, you know, uh, fully cognizant of the um, of the Jewish tradition. And it, it's the kind of thing I think a Herodian would say. I mean, he, he does come over as, as one of these sem- part, partly Judaized uh, uh, Herodians who's very interested in religion. But he's very, very interested in, in the opportunities that the Roman Empire is bringing. And uh, Paul dies in Rome, but everyone thinks as a martyr. Uh, but if you remember the story, he, he, he's going to be let off by the, the governor. Uh, I forget, where was it? Caesarea? Um, Festus, the Roman governor? I forget. I, it's gone from my mind. But he... he, he demands to be tried in Rome. This is what he demands. He says it's his right as a citizen. He doesn't want to be let off with suspicion. He wants to be tried. So he wants to go to Rome. He wants to make his statement in Rome. And we don't really know what happened to him after that. We don't even know if he he was executed. The the legend is that he was a martyr. Uh, But we really don't know. He might have been settled somewhere in France, as as Herod uh, Agrippa was later. (laughs) I mean, seriously. You know, we do, we don't know. We don't know. I, I mean, I think Paul's one of the most extraordinary individuals in history. I do. I think he's incredible. You you can't help but admire him from all you've read. But you have always this question. Did he, you know, what was his real motive? What was he, you know, he produces a universal religion. He produces something you can sell to the yeah. slaves. Uh, and this was the that, thing. I mean, yeah, know, this that, again that was quite... Really- that's what gets yeah. to me. I mean, he it, it's his view, his theory, his he he created it. And 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 yet without him would would this would the well, philosophy without him, and story. Yeah. Well, I suppose without him 
um, probably Jesus might still be, uh, might have been accepted as part of the Jewish history. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and he, might, he might have, he might have had um, a Jesus party within rabbinic Judaism, for all, for all I know. But but the, but the trouble was that that by going over to Rome, you, he tainted Jesus with the the view that Jesus actually didn't like the Jews very much. You know, the Jews had had their chance, and they crucified the Lord of Glory, as the the old Catholic accusation went, that explains yeah. the anti-Semitism. Well, you know, you wouldn't have had the Holocaust without without Paul. You know, the the influence of Paul is enormous. Uh, the universal um, suspicion of Jews in medieval Europe, which spreads right through Russia, Central Europe, mainstream Europe, Catholic Europe, Orthodox Europe. Uh, this this hatred of Jews because of the alleged cause of the crucifixion. I mean, this all comes from Paul. Absolutely, he, he, he's, he's, you, you, you could imagine somebody saying, well, you're a Jew hater, really, aren't you? you know. Nowadays, he would definitely wouldn't be allowed on the internet <laughs> because <laughs> he would, they, would, they would say he was, um, he was a you know, Jew hater, basically. You know, he's, the, purity, he's the, the purity of what Jesus and John the Baptist taught was far more gentle than what Paul has evolved it into. I don't know how it's it's hard on this gentle thing. Um, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. <laughs> I was brought up on, and I still say it sometimes when I'm feeling particularly isolated. The old childhood prayers. Uh, it's like holding on to a teddy bear, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I do think there is a great spiritual. Uh, treasury of love within the teachings of the Jewish prophets. Um, and I think it comes out in, in, it obviously comes out in the parables of the stories that Jesus is supposed to have told. And there is this great sympathy with truthful, ordinary people doing things because they're right and caring and the widows might there's lovely stories you know she gave her last penny you know to to charity and all all these things um the good samaritan beautiful beautiful this i I would i mean the the heart of the the heart of the religion is there in these stories whether they were john's stories jesus stories should it really matter it matters what these things mean to us uh, it, it, it's absolutely vital that we have access to the kingdom of heaven, that we go into ourselves and beyond our ordinary selves into an awareness of God. This is the most vital thing for a human being to mature, develop, and be able to survive the horrors of life. And this is of enormous importance. And I, I always am suspicious that people could be using my work, you know, to, to denigrate true true spiritual religion. I only write my things to clarify areas where there has been great debate and much confusion uh, to, and to clarify areas of history and, and so on. Um, but I think, you know, I remember my mother used to say, I said, Mum, what do you believe? You know, she said, well, I, I believe in the religion of love or words to that effect, I think she said. Uh, and I said, yes, love is love is what it's about but you've got to love the truth as well and that doesn't mean claiming you've got it it means loving to hear it rather than maybe always have to think you speak it uh Mm -hmm. we tend to distort we tend in our lives to distort the truth so but you must love truth and you must uh, you know love your your neighbor as yourself these are eternal verities of human spiritual survival if we forget them, uh, we don't survive spiritually. Now, the Christianity, as it's come to us, has all these incredible symbols. I mean, it's a hodgepodge of myth and magic and a bit of history and uh, a hell of a lot of meaning. Um, <laughs> but it, it has a stained history, Christianity. It has a stained history, I would say, the same about all the religions, have a, a, a history 
of activity totally at variance with the sensitivities of the great, uh, we call the mystics, uh, masters, mistresses of the faith. But, I mean, I look forward to the day when we can truly say, you know, mankind began with one faith and we will be a people of faith and also of spiritual knowledge. That's what I, that's what I work for. That's what I do all this for. I, act, I believe that this is the same for John and Jesus. And any, anything which, which makes us escape from too many uh, assumptions about religion, that makes religion ordinary, rather than strange and interesting. Uh, I want to I resist. I think one of the terrible things about religion as an organization, whether whatever, whoever's Baptist, Methodist, Anglican, Catholic, whatever it is, is that they tend to, they've tended to present the faith as if they know it all, and there's an answer for everything, and uh, all this sort of stuff. And you just go along with it. You know, it becomes a kind of tidal wave. Well, what's the point of questioning? Yeah. I, I think this makes a lot of people leave it. They they want to get out of the way of the tidal wave. They don't want to be washed in the blood of the land. They want to think about things. So I think the kind of work I'm doing is to help people do that. And because I believe there are people who want to and need to. Well, I think what you've done with, with uh, this book especially is that you've made um, both John and Jesus more real than than the Bible does. Um, you've given us the time frame that they grew in, the political atmosphere they had to survive, and it, you've made their message more real and and I, I love the you, you went into a great deal of of um of explaining that you know John baptized with water and yet Paul baptized with the holy spirit and and um it 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 made for me a a greater empathy for for the people that were involved not not the divinity but the people and the message they were trying to get across and and how they they were um sidetracked manipulated and then used yes yes that's and isn't that happening today in our own world just the same we still have the herod antipasses we've still got the herodian dynasty we've still got the priesthood we've still got the battles between priests we've still got the people who want to be baptized we've still we've still we've got the whole picture you, the, the, it, 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 in, a, in a strange way, that even when you get to the history, which I delineate in the book, even when you get to that, you see a, a mirror of our own insane times. The only difference is then they didn't have the, magnific- the ridiculous magnification of our media, which magnifies everything beyond its true size. You remember those old films in the 50s when the, the invasion of the giant spiders, and all they do is film a spider and project, you know, optically connect it with a picture of people, and you have your giant spider. Well, that's what the media does. It simply magnifies a normal thing till it becomes overpowering. And we, we, we get this every day now. And the, 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 but what they did have, it, they didn't have the media, and that they had stories. And the natural tendency of any story, as everyone knows, the more you tell the story, the fish gets bigger, you know, the man gets taller, the enemy gets greater, and what started out as a cool breeze becomes a storm. And this is a is a is a tendency of human beings because we 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 are we are locked in this material mentality. We think if there's more of something, it's more important. And I think the great thing about spiritual teaching is is very much the less is more. Go into the wilderness, you know, and that could be a wilderness. Uh, in your own room uh, and you be quiet, be silent, uh, devo- cut down the magnification, cut down the volume. Uh, you don't need amplification. The st- still small voice of calm as uh, Elijah is acquainted with. So um, 
we have the same challenge today to listen to the voice crying in the wilderness as they did in the first century. This story of Jesus and John and all these amazing people simply repeats itself through history. It's no good saying, oh, it's the fulfillment of prophecy. This prophecy is a daily fact. Everything that's ever happened happens every day. Earthquakes, wind, fire, war, rumors of wars. It's always been going on. This is, we're talk, this is what life is like. This is, this is the mess, and, and what true spiritual religion asks us to do is to look into that daily reality and say, yes, and where's God in this? Where am I in this? Where do we go? Where are we from? Who are we? Where are we going? And then, you, then if you're serious about this, you will start to see a path. And that, that path is the royal path. And nobody can... Uh, can tell you what it is. You must find it for yourself. Exactly. I, I you know, in, in a way, you kind of would like to be able to sit down with Jesus and John, and you, you say, are doing. You do. You can now. You can. You, I tell you, you can do that. That's exactly well, I, what you can do. Do you think I couldn't have written this book if I hadn't been entertained by the sense of presence that these people are eternal? You know, that well, it, it's not just Jesus. Who, Jesus isn't the only one on the right hand of the Father. You, know, you could be on the right hand of the Father. Well, hopefully. It's, it's, that's, um, that's, you know, well, you say, that the that, mess- do you mean the, it? Yeah, that the message is so simple that most people miss it. Well, and, exactly. And, and, that's, and I think you're absolutely right. I think that... that that this is a cycle, that this is something that humanity has gone through time after time after time through generations. And Yeah, yeah, we're still, we're still crucifying the Messiah and, and worshipping, uh, you know, the, the, the Moloch, the, the false god. Absolutely. Yeah. Look at look what's going on today. I mean, you know, as long as the dollar's strong, we're, you know, people talk about the dollar in exactly the same way the Philistines referred to Dagon, you know, their great god. You know, that if Dagon fell, it would be all over. And this this amazing thing in the Jewish experience, and why we still uh, cannot avoid, in my opinion, the Bible, is that the Jewish experience is all of this nonsense about who you are, what you are, what the powers of the world appear to be, how to get security in this life, and all the stuff that they're selling every day, insurance, 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 all these insurances, are void, ultimately void. They are not what it's really about. And this is not a welcome message. I mean, you know, the only thing I can, uh, that ought to be welcome people is there is a way through this. That ought to be the welcome message. But in fact, true religion has always scared a large number of people off and, and always will. So it's not like you could ever have channel truth and truth would be spoken, and the world would say, oh, yeah, I love it. I want to be part of that. Oh, yeah. Well, they might <laughs> think of the 10, minute, 10 minutes of enthusiasm, and they'll see what, how also then the effects of it in, in what they cling to. It, like the rich man who came to Jesus and said, you know, I think you're fantastic, Jesus. You've got everything going. I want to be part of it. And Jesus said, okay, I hear what you say. I'm really happy to have you. Now, just go and sell all your stuff and give all the money to the poor and come back. And of course, he never sees him again. I mean, that, yeah. now if that's is that story not played out every day of every year? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, but I think John you know, it, John's had a bad press. That's the that's the nub of the book. John's had a ridiculously poor press, and people haven't taken seriously what Jesus himself said: "No greater man was ever born of woman," and that ought to. You know, there should be. I want to see John the Baptist, the TV series, the movie, and tell it like it is, you know, and do something instead of the uh, usual tribe. <laughs> well, I, I think you've got a great point because just knowing the truth about I'll him. I'll even write it for you. Know. <laughs> very happy, well, got very good, happy to write the script. You've got a great beginning here because um, all you have to do is sit down with a book. And you know, I, you know, I, I had, I have, you know, I, I had. I've got to tell you, Barbara. I've got to tell you, Barbara. It's absolutely true. 
I don't understand everything that came through that book. I, I've now read it. It's one I love reading, not because I like reading Tobias Churton. I don't think of it like that. This is something that was written by me, yes. But a lot of it was on, a, on another level. And I keep coming back to this book. That one, possibly more than any other. There are a couple I've written that I think, oh, whoa, Toby, why, what, where did you when you wrote this? You know, how did you do it? And uh, I just thank the Lord. You know. It really, it was, it was, and I'm not saying, you know, it's not highfalutin. You've read the book. It's, it's factual. But there was oh, something, there's something that's definitely moving. Well, what I, what I was fascinated with, you know, I, I knew about Josephus um, and, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, but you found other texts that, that, you know, added greater meat to the entire story. I mean, you're historically documenting um, something that is the greatest story ever told. And, and, it's, and what, what it comes down to is it wasn't a story. <laughs> and exactly. and yeah. so so that so that in spite of what Paul has done, and and you know the you know the putting together of texts that were never meant to be together to create a dialogue or or a or a picture of of a way of life supposedly, um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I guess the Bible had to be done. I mean, Constantine said, I want a Bible, and they made a Bible for him. But um, it, it was what Helena and Constantine and Eusebius and I don't know who else that put together the the dialogue that created the story that is the best-selling book in the world. Yeah, you know, I mean, something came, came through. Something came through, but I, 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 I can never forget when I hear about that. I can never forget. I mean, obviously, the Bible is a providential creation in, in some respects, but I never forget that it's also used and has been used to condemn good people to the flames. And yeah. that it has been used as a means to control other people. Uh, in other words, it hasn't led... It has been used rather than its purpose, which is to lead one to God. It has it has been abused. It's a it is a, the most abused work, isn't it? It really is. I mean, I often think that if you know a truth, maybe we shouldn't even talk about it. Uh, we we we're not supposed to put our light under a bushel, but as, as a good fellow once said, it might be a good idea to put it under a strong lampshade, you know, because <laughs> When you let out to the common mind and and also, and, and the and the malefic mind and the mind of the perverted type, power crazy, egotistical, narcissistic, you you let this stuff into those hands and you you create you create the inverse monster out of it, uh-huh. and uh, the horror of human history shows us so all too. It would be better if these books were had been. You know, we're we'll, we'll very rarely seen, I think, in some ways. But that's against the whole Protestant thing, which was with the, that if you made the Bible public, you would have a, you'd have paradise in a few generations. You know, the, the Bible society has spread the Bible into umpteen languages and all the rest of that. I, the price of that was to make Bibles too common. And yet, and then I think of the night I was, I was at sea once on a liner crossing the Atlantic, and it got rough. And I was feeling rather uneasy at two o'clock in the morning, whatever it was. And there was a one of those Gideon Bibles in the drawer. And I drew it out of the drawer and I opened it. And the first line I read was, for I am the Lord of the waves. Uh-huh. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, well, thank God for the Bible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that I changed my that. life, I can tell you this. That moment, from from then on, the voyage to me was a, was a dream. It was a delight because it unblocked my fear. Just oh, that yeah. line. Yeah. And oh, it was I, a fear I, that not... wanted unblocking. You know, it, it, it wants, that fear wanted unblocking. And we're all stuffed, especially today with these terrible things happening. We're all stuffed with these fears. And they do need unblocking. 
And I think people like John can do that. I think they, he was a, a fear unblocker. I would tend to agree. I, I think there's far greater wisdom in his teachings and, and what he spoke about than, than he's been given credit for, us, and especially since Jesus took up the, the message and, message, and helped yes. to put it. Well, I, I think they both, I, you know, I get a feeling sometimes that the two of them sat over a beer someplace and said, okay, this is what we want to make sure we get out there. And um, I do believe that they were both absolutely divinely guided. But, but at the same time, they were here in physical and they had a mission to fulfill and it's almost like they were mission impossible. You know, we, we, have to, we have to get this point out there so that people will be able to utilize it to their benefit. Well, you know, um, if you've you read the, la the last part of the John section uh, where I'd say that, you know, they were, that it was a, it was a spiritual mission to, uh -huh. reset, to reset the creation. The third day that we hear about, he will be raised on the third day, of course, is, is, is you know, the, 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 the appearance on the earth of the seed. And that seed had been choked through the history of human beings. And I, I believe that Jesus and John were in a kind of, if you like, a secret mystical, as you say, mission impossible, uh, impossible to conceive of almost. Uh, to put the creation right again. And I think in some respects they succeeded. A lot of the things that were going he hellishly wrong in their time uh, started to dissolve. The temple system, which had become totally corrupt, dis is disappears within uh -huh. uh, a generation of, of Paul. Um, the, the, the nature of religion in the world changes. Uh, but all these changes are all right, but it requires people to be engaged with these changes. Uh, a person can change, um, but we need we 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 are faced now with the realization that that we we there has to be a far more general change in in our spiritual direction. I think we have reached the uh, reached the elastic limit say one person can do uh, we, we now need to and I'm talking about the whole planet not any of these country, these countries you know I always refer to God's Jews God's Muslims God's Christians God's atheists God's agnostics God's Chinese God's English whatever you know it, it, we, we draw up these walls we're the ones who destroy the bridges of what was originally one being of man, and I, these 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 works point to that the original man is the man, of, and I'm talking man in the generic, not the male sense. The original man is the man of light, who came from a higher realm and has been lost in darkness, and uh, this light has been left on. I picked it up, and other people have passed on. The flame. I love and, the uh, uh, you know. I, I love the metaphor you use, and, and did it come from <clears throat> old prophe prophecies in the Old Testament? The, the fact of the seed that creates the f uh, the fruit that has the seed within, <clears throat> referring to humanity, was that from? Yes. Well, that's in Genesis, that? isn't it? That's yeah. The third, okay. third day, yeah. The seed which bears inside it, the seed, I forget the exact phrase, but that's what the resurrection is about. Uh, is, is, and that's why it's the, on the third day, the priest would, would offer the new, uh, the new growth to the people. And that was, that's what the third day is, is about, uh, after Passover, is the, the, the first fruits. The first fruits are shown to the people by the high priest. That's the symbol of the resurrection. That's why Jesus raised on the third day. It's, it's not because he went to bed at Friday and got up on Sunday, because that's not three days. Uh, the, third, the third day is the, the revelation of the new, the new fruit. 
In other words, it's, it's a new, what Jesus, I think what they're aiming at, what, what maybe Jesus knew more than Paul, I don't know, uh, than, than John, I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, but the aim was to produce a new fruit, a new creation, and, and effectively a, 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 an open door to the kingdom of heaven for all mankind. I believe they did open that door, but nobody's forced to go through it. Well, there probably have been some that have gone through it, but um, but the reality is that that <clears throat> we we have an eternal part within all of us, so that we'll keep working till we get there. <laughs> and um, I love that metaphor. That was to me that was. Um, it struck a chord, and the fact that you know that that Jesus died, but the seeds that he planted have lived on. And, yes, and that's the, right. The that's same, it. the same with you know, the same with John the yeah, Baptist. But, but you see, and it, and isn't it Paul who says, you know, the seed has to go into the ground and die to be reborn? You know, that's Paul attributed to Paul that line, isn't it? So you know, you yeah. can't just dismiss Paul. Uh, strange, mi- mixed up character he may well have been, uh, but you know he he did have a lot of the wisdom uh, as well. The, 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 that that's it. The the seed has to go into the ground and then and then be reborn. And uh, I don't think this is you can just make a side to say oh this is DNA and we carry ourselves on in DNA helix spiral chromosomes all that stuff. I I think we're talking about the spiritual seed and uh, yeah. It only requires you to make the leap of judging, looking at, instead of thinking of the spiritual as the insubstantial, the unreal, whereas matter is solid and the dependable, the real, and and our security. Try it the other way around and say, spirit, yes, difficult to see, etc. Take that as as your primal reality, and then you will find a totally different value in your natural world. Jesus used all these parables based on nature. He didn't, he didn't talk highfalutin philosophy and metaphysics. He saw that the natural world is a symbol of the spiritual world and, the, and vice versa. The supernatural is the symbol of the natural world and vice versa. There's a, these two worlds are really one. Well, now, all of the people that wrote the books in the Bible attributed to these people, none of them actually physically knew Jesus. Well, absolutely. So uh, that and it's, ha- it's very clear, it's very clear from the way they write that they don't, and they, they were finding out that most of them were finding their Jesus through looking at Old Testament prophecies and just saying, well, that's a prophecy, so that must have happened. So they just rewrite the story into the into their first allegedly first century narrative, um, and they said, well, it must have been like that, you know. So this, because the whole the original preaching about Jesus uh, that that the Peter apparently apparently the original preaching seems to have been that look the prophecies have been fulfilled, but what do we mean by the prophecies have been fulfilled? Which prophecies and what aspects of them have been fulfilled? You know, it wasn't a question of Somebody said in uh, 700 BC, this will happen. Oh, and it's just happened. It's not that. There are no, th- those sort of predictions. It's not prediction. Prophecy is stating what is true. In other words, the word is made flesh. What, what we thought was an ideal for the future has actually happened amongst us. And somehow this conviction that something had happened in the lives of these people, that really was the fulfillment and they could fulfillment means you can see what the original meaning was it's become manifest the word has been made flesh you know the the what what you thought was imaginary is real you know and uh the great struggle of, of real christians through history has been to try and convey this thought in a way that means something to people very very difficult we're very, very attached to our, to our myth, our myth, our myths and our paradigms of what's real, and and the true message of the of, of the master has always confounded 
one sense of reality. Well, and this is, because, yeah, go on. Because, because none of what has been written were from people that physically knew him or heard him, I, I, it, it boggles my mind that more is not pres- since since John had well, who's larger yeah, following. Yeah, yeah, of, course. Of, of course, Barbara, but the, the, the problem is, is that it's not been in the church's interest to suggest that their foundation documents were secondhand. You know? and, and so for uh, that, you've got to remember that until this century, most people in the world could not read. They had to be read to. They couldn't yeah, read, but, but, and they, therefore they couldn't, uh, they couldn't assess the truth value. But be, and but and the whole thing is, is sewn up. Why has not more been preserved of what John said? Well, I think uh, not much has been preserved of what Julius Caesar said, apart from what he actually wrote, that some of his works yeah. have been... You know, that, that you can't... Ex- I mean, uh, somebody once said to me, archaeology is, is really like, imagine a whole load of papers burnt in a fire... Uh, going up a chimney, and what lands in front of the uh, fireplace afterwards is what we, what archaeology can tell us of history. So we should mm-hmm. we, we should be great, very grateful for what we have got to go on. Uh, inadequate as it is, we can't build up a 3D picture. Uh, that's always the thing that amazed me about movies was or, uh, biblical movies, the way they fill the screen with things, and it gives the impression that we know what things are like. But of course. You spoke to somebody at the time, they'd say, no, no, it wasn't like that at all. Uh, was no, no, oh, no. Yeah. It did. Good grief, they wouldn't have worn that, you know, and that wasn't what it was, and that's ridiculous, you know. But, but the, because we're used to a cinematic way of representing our stories, we, because the screen is filled, we think the story is filled. But in fact, to build the true story, you have to start with the elements. And obviously, most people are too busy in their lives to do this. So I write books, so you can just read mine, and you, get, <laughs> you, get, you can get it. You can get it for a few hours of your of your valuable time. And you hopefully, not waste. Twenty first, you become a twenty first century Josephus. Well, I, I I'm not very fond of Josephus, so I don't like that. <laughs> He's a very good writer, and I, I hope I'm more than I hope I'm more than an historian. Although he was trying to do something very important. He was trying to say to the Roman and Greek speaking world, look, not all Jews are nut- nutcases. You know, yeah. That's what he was trying to say. They're but not all preserve, seditious. Rebels. He preserved history too, which I think is phenomenal. He did. Oh, oh, of course. You know, the trouble is being a historian is I often take that for granted, but you're absolutely right. He preserved. Well, I'm, without just even, his, well you're right. Without Josephus' account, my book could not have even begun, couldn't even be considered. So well, and, yes, and history and history is written by the <clears throat> history is written by people the victorious. Right. <laughs> so written, well, um, not always. It's written, it's written by the people who can write and and maintained yeah. by those valued. Um, the the victorious writings very often uh, don't last. Actually, um, you know, the truth will out. I would say. I always looked upon Josephus as as someone who was had to please the people that were paying him clearly, but who was trying to be as accurate as he could be without being a heretic. So I I, I really think that that I think he did a good job. He served what eighteen books, twenty books, something like that. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, 200 years ago, Christian families in in Europe and and, uh, probably in parts of America used to read Josephus. You know, a a pious family would have the Bible and they'd have Josephus. After William Whiston's translation came out at the end of the 17th century. So Josephus was regarded as part of Christian education and it, it has ceased to a large extent, to be that. And it's a great, great sadness and a great loss. So I think there's a great deal of reality in, in Josephus' account. And now we also have the, uh, the growing 
testimony coming from the so-called Dead Sea Scrolls, which is basically a library of first century BC uh, Jewish life. Um, I think it is a great mistake to think of it as an Essene library, as you constantly do. Uh, it is anyway a collection of a collection of religious writings from the period of Jesus's uh, father, grandfather, great grandfather. I mean, it is the foundation period of what uh, John and Paul, uh, Jesus and Paul, were all raving about. It, that to ignore it is a terrible, terrible mistake. Uh, it is a it is a revelation actually what's coming out of the uh, of the so-called scrolls. All the, uh, in fact all religious writings are Dead Sea Scrolls in a way. I mean they've all been secreted. The Codex Sinaiticus was found at St Catherine Monastery in in Sinai uh, by Tischendorf in the 19th century. That's provided provided people with a, a much better uh, test for translations. Um, so we. The discovery of original scrolls is, 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 is terribly important, and, and it's very odd, I think, that the, the Gnostic Library, the Kenobostian Library, the Nagamadi Library, were discovered in 45, uh, the so-called Dead Sea Scrolls, 47, just uh, both just after the war. Very strange uh, coincidence after the, I don't know, I, I, it doesn't seem accidental to me, it seems, uh, seems to be you know, well, you know, <laughs> and I like to I like to believe that there's still a lot out there yet to be discovered. I mean, we haven't hunted yeah, down uh, all of the caves. Well, you'd you know? have to be very greedy, Barbara, because I don't think we've got to the bottom of the stuff that uh, that we have uh, we have inherited. I think we should we uh, most people have never read a Gnostic gospel. So, I think you know before we start wishing for uh, more more stuff from come out of jars and holes. Uh, it would be nice if people start to embrace what is already coming out uh, and pay less attention to the stock, stock market and a bit more attention to their immortal soul. I, I think it is sad that, that people don't, that, that so many people stick just to the one book and not realize that there are so many other texts out there. That I mean, there's the yeah. Gospel of Mary. There's the Gospel of yeah. I mean, there's so many Gospels out there. It, it enough to choke. Yeah, a horse. I think. I think. I, okay, I think Barbara, we're, we're, this conversation is starting to ramble. So you know, I think uh, we, you know. I, I, I think if, if if our listeners haven't got enough to chew on by now, it'd be a, <laughs> a sad world. That's true, and I, I think it's, it's time we we kind of. First of all, recommend that everybody buys the book because I think the Mysteries of John the Baptist is is a fascinating book. I will read it more uh-huh. than once for sure. Yeah, it's and, definitely something you'll go back back to definitely. And, and I'm uh, looking for forward it. to your to your next book too because that happens to be a topic I'm fascinated with as well. But but this well, we is, can talk about all, that next year. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But this this book gives you so much meat to chew on and to investigate and to look into and to masticate, <laughs> to, to make sense and, and apply to your own life. That is just, it, it's an amazing book, and I did love it. I truly did. Oh. And um, what is your website? So we can send people to your website. Oh, it, it's all one word, TobiasCherton.com. Okay. TobiasCherton.com. I see you can, people can go to that website and can, can learn more about you and, and all of the books that you've written. Um, I, I loved this book. I truly did. And I, I love the, the book about um, Alastair Crowley that I read, too. I haven't read all of your Crowley books, but... Um, the one that I did read, I, I very much enjoyed. And, and I want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us today because this has been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you, Barbara. It's been lovely to speak to you again. And I look forward to the next time. Absolutely. I can't wait for that book. So, 
So I think we'll tie it up and we will let Mark go because Mark, I want to thank Mark Eddie very much for being my go-between here because I, I can't do shows with people who are out of the country without Mark. So he is an integral, important part to, to this whole nightlight extravaganza. And I want to thank you again. I want to recommend everybody to check out uh, Tobias Kirtan because um, he has some magic there. And uh, I truly believe he's inspired. And, and I think that once you read some of his books, you'll agree that, that there is something very special going on there. Thanks again, everybody. This will be up on YouTube later on today. And uh, check it out. And if uh, you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do so. That's the only way we know you're listening. Thanks again, everybody, and good night.